The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled SIRDS at the Inflection Point in Pretreated ER Positive HER2 Negative Breast Cancer Addressing Unmet Needs, Establishing New Standards of Care, and Improving Patient Outcomes with Novel ER Targeting Therapies. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash DFJ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Okay, so good evening, good morning, good afternoon, because there are people maybe on the other side of the screens. So hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you all here to talk about a topic that more and more is getting more interest. You all have heard that, unfortunately, there are some drugs that have failed to demonstrate an improvement, even in phase three trials. So the new search are getting important implications in the clinical practice, and we all know that one of them has improved outcomes for our patients with hormone positive HER2 negative disease. So I think that we are going to have an amazing discussion with two friends and colleagues, experts in the field. So the title of this Symposium is searched at the inflection point in pretreated ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. So I am, my name is Javier Cortez. I'm a fanatic Real Madrid supporter. But more than that, I prefer Barça to lose. Apologize for that, but this is my disclosure. I have to say that, apologize. So I work now in both cities, in Madrid and in Barcelona and today in Paris. Great pleasure and welcome all of you from outside Europe to be with us uh, today and this, these days. So this is today's faculty. I'm joined by Aditya Bardia, who is the director of the breast cancer research at Mass General Hospital in uh, Boston, and also Francois Clement Bidart, sorry about the pronunciation. For me, it's easier to pronounce your name than yours. Sorry about that. Also, Professor of Medical Oncology, the head of the Breast Cancer Group in Institute Curie, Curie, Curie in, in Paris, in France. So thank you very much for hosting us here. The today's agenda. So we'll start talking a little bit about biology to, to, to understand which are the fundamental concepts on the biology of this tumor type breast cancer, ER positive, HER2 negative. I will try to make like a brief overview about the standard of care today. And last but not least, we'll talk about the new role, the new emerging options regarding search. And this talk will be given by Aditya. And finally, again, we'll have a clinical case, we'll have polling questions to discuss, and many, many uh, hot questions. I can guarantee that I will make key and very hot and controversial questions. I promise that. So Aditya, both of you be prepared because if I ask, I don't have to answer. It's always lovely to moderate something. So without further delay, let me start with Francois talking about a little bit about biology and concepts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier, and thanks for uh, to the organizing committee for having me tonight. Uh, so the idea of that first talk tonight is to remind you about estrogen receptor biology and also to introduce your key concept about resistance to endocrine resistance and with a focus on ESR1 mutation, which are uh, becoming a very important subject in the field of ER plus ER2 negative breast cancer. So, Let's start uh, with a very basic slide, uh, just to remind you very briefly the different mechanisms of action of the current endocrine therapy and also future ones. First, on the left side, so just to remind you, and I'm sure you all of you know that, that uh, so androgen are converted into estrogen by um, enzymes that are named aromatase. Estrogen uh, can bind to uh, estrogen receptor alpha, which will bind, uh, translocate into the nucleus and bind estrogen receptive re responsive elements. And um, upon binding of the ER alpha and uh, 
the recruitment of co activators. So the gene transcription machinery will ultimately lead to uh, tumor growth. Um, aromatase inhibitors are well characterized. You know, they are preventing the um, aromatase inhibitor, uh, aromatase to function. So they are depleting the tumor and the body uh, of estrogen. And then estrogen receptor is not able to uh, translocate in the nucleus and activate its uh, transcriptional machinery. When we move to CERM, so um, of course tamoxifen, what we know with CERM, so these compounds are uh, agents that are binding to the estrogen receptor. And upon binding, so uh, estrogen receptor cannot activate these, uh, the transcriptional program, its transcriptional program. So, which means they are uh, modulating the transcriptional program of the estrogen receptor. That's why they are named as selective estrogen receptor modulators. If we move to the third, um, so these new compounds, or at least say the, we have Sylvestran, which is an old compound, but now we have the oral thirds. I think that there is something very new in our understanding on the way they work. And um, it comes from a um, paper that has been published uh, by Genentech like two years ago. I will um, discuss that a bit later in my talk. But briefly, so what we understand now from the third is that they are also binding to estrogen receptor alpha. But um, their primary role is to impair the mobility of estrogen receptor. And ER alpha will be trapped on DNA. And because of its impaired mobility, uh, it will lead to a lower chromatin accessibility, which will prevent um, the transcriptional machinery to act and to uh, drive the tumor uh, growth. And degradation of the estrogen receptor is just a consequence of this immobilization of ER alpha on DNA. So which means um, ER degradation is basically not required for thirds to be active. I will, again, go back on that a bit later. And then we have a last um, category of drugs, which is very new, which are protax. So proteolysis targeting chimeras. So uh, we have protax about many proteins. And uh, there is at least one protax that is currently being developed that is targeting uh, ER alpha. And protax are drugs that are uh, made of a ligand. And uh, so it's an ER ligand. And in the case of the protax that is currently being developed, that ligand is a uh, tamoxifen. And then you have a linker, and the other part of the protac is a um, um, compound that will um, bind to the E3 ligase, which will in turn activate the ubiquitinating machinery that will lead to ER degradation. So um, just to differentiate for protac to be active, you really need to degrade ER. But maybe that for said, this uh, is not as mandatory as we, we previously thought. So let's move to uh, resistance to endocrine therapy and mostly resistance to aromatase inhibitor. So there are many papers that have been published on this topic. So I choose to show you um, one uh, which has been published by the MSKCC team. And they were able to compare before and after uh, so treatment uh, and aromatase inhibitor some, um, from metastatic breast cancer patients. And they reported four main ways um, to escape um, the selective pressure um, related to andro uh, estrogen receptor um, deprivation of its ligand. So um, among these four, so it could be ESR1 mutation. And as you see here in this graph, so these, they reported that the mutations were really rare, less than about 1% in uh, untreated or uh, primary breast tumors, but these um, mutations become very prevalent in patients that have metastatic breast cancer uh, after progression on aromatase inhibitor. Um, they also found that uh, the tumor could escape the selective pressure of um, aromatase inhibitor through uh, at the acquisition of alteration in the MAP uh, kinase pathway and also at the um, more transcriptomic side, so um, MIC amplification can also drive a bunch of uh, tumors um, that will escape the um, pressure of um, our TAS inhibitor. So we have four and the fourth mechanism are unknown mechanism. And so here you see that patients who have in their tumor before treatment 
um, these mechanisms of regression could be uh, isolated. They have a shorter PFS. So um, to recap, so this is a um, take-home message from the um, paper I just mentioned. Um, so at the beginning of hormonal therapy, at the metastatic stage, you have um, many tumor cells. Most of them will be sensitive to aromatase um, inhibitor or to uh, estrogen uh, depletion. But uh, some of them will be selected by the treatment. And when the tumor will progress, a tumor could progress through the acquisition of one of these four pathways. So again, most of uh, our escape pathways are still to be characterized. But ESR1 mutation drive a significant part of endocrine resistance. So these um, ESR1, so it's a mutation of the estrogen receptor 1 gene. And so here's the answer to the first question uh, you, got, you, you had to answer uh, initially, is that um, that first statement was false because uh, it stated that ESR1 encodes estrogen receptor alpha, which is a subunit of ER. It's not a subunit, it's an isoform. So we have ER alpha and ER beta. Uh, ER alpha is what we are referring to as the estrogen receptor. And the, um, let's say the role of ER beta is um, not very well characterized currently. So um, let's move and focus to, on this mutation. Um, Again, if you look at the ESR1 gene, so you have different domain, and what has been observed is that these mutations are appearing in defined hotspots. Uh, you have a first hotspot, which is located in exon 5 of uh, estrogen receptor, and this, this is a E3Q, uh, so ATQ uh, mutation, which account for about 10 to 20 percent of all ESR1 mutations. Then the rest of mutations are mostly appearing uh, in 536 to 538 residues, and um, most of those mutations are located here. In this paper from the Dana Faber uh, Cancer Institute, they also shown that these uh, mutations were enriched in late uh, metastatic breast cancer. So, what about the mechanism of action? Basically, um, so normal wild type ESR1 uh, cells, so uh, estradiol is needed for ER to bind on DNA and activate the transcriptional machinery. But in case of a uh, mutation, then the ER is constitutionally active, so which means it doesn't require um, a stradiol uh, to bind on DNA and to activate the ER transcriptional program. And the answer to the uh, polling question number two, uh, so it, the, that second statement was right, ESR1 mutation allow ER alpha to be activated in the absence of its ligands. Again, so uh, we see almost no mutation in primary tumor or at the end of uh, adjuvant on the green therapy. At times of uh, tumor relapses, these mutations remain rare in this uh, small study by a French group. But at time of tumor progression, these mutations come very prevalent. And so this is the answer to the third question, so the third statement. That statement was false because uh, it, it stated that ESR1 mutations are often detected during adjuvant AI-based therapy. And in fact, the answer is that they are mostly um, selected during the first-line AI-based therapy. So here we move to data we got in Padawan. So Padawan is a very important trial uh, that uh, we run in France. And the primary outcome was reported last year at San Antonio. But uh, so in this trial, more than 1,000 patients started palbocytlib and aromatase inhibitor, and we tracked the appearance of ESR1 mutation. So before treatment start, but then you know, of the first line, but then also during treatments. At baseline, so if you focus at patients that are not yet started AI and palbocytlib, overall, we confirm that the prevalence is very low, 3.2%, so which means these mutations are rare prior to AI exposure in the uh, metastatic setting. We looked for um, association with uh, clinical and ca um, pathological characteristics, and what we found is that they were mostly detected in patients with bone metastasis, patients who were postmenopausal, and in patients who received AI as adjuvant treatment. However, uh, you can see that the prevalence of this mutation uh, remains quite low, even in patients who received AI as adjuvant treatment. I'm going to skip it. And we then look in Padawan at the PFS of patients that were um, 
with ESA1 mutation detected at baseline, so prior to exposure to uh, palbociclib and aromatase inhibitor. And you see here that they have a significantly shorter PFS, but still that PFS was uh, 11 months despite the fact they, received, they were treated with AI plus palbociclib. I think personally that it's 11 months PFS is likely due to the intrinsic activity of uh, palbociclib because this uh, mutation um, told us that AI would be uh, inactive in these patients. So we also looked in Padawan at um, you know, when these mutations start to emerge during um, the treatment. And what we observed is that in patients with primary endocrine resistance, so patients that are progressing within the first six months of the first line CDK46 plus AI therapy, we had a very limited number of patients progressing with a detectable ESR1 mutation in their blood. But after six months, ESR1 mutation became a major mechanism of resistance. So the, polling, um, the answer to the polling question was, ESR1 mutations are rare in patients with primary endocrine resistance to AI and CDK46. That is true. If a patient is progressing during the first six months of an AI plus CDK46 uh, treatment in first line, it is very likely that uh, you won't be able to find any ESR1 mutation. Reverse side is that uh, in patients who have uh, progressed after six months, an ESR1 mutation is quite likely. We also looked in Padawan at uh, features that were uh, associated with, um, you know, uh, the onset during therapy with ESR1 mutation. So this is a very preliminary analysis that has been uh, reported at ESMO uh, three years ago. So and, uh, we will update this analysis and we plan to uh, present it at San Antonio. But what we got again on the first event is that uh, patients with bone metastases were uh, more than two times more likely to develop an ESR1 mutation during their first-line treatment with AI and CDK46. It was also true with skin metastases. I'm not sure I can explain why. And uh, patients with liver metastases were less likely to develop an ESR1 mutation during the first-line AI plus CDK46 inhibitor. That is quite important, this kind of results, especially to drive and to understand you know, the first-line trials with current oral thirds, because depending on the population, you may have trials that may be enriched or not into this kind of patient subgroups that are more likely or less likely to uh, develop an ESR1 mutation during treatments with an AI plus CDK46. So what about targeting this mutation? Because I, I spend a lot of time to explain the biology and the kinetics of this ESR1 mutation. But the beauty of this ESR1 mutation is that they can be targeted. And uh, I think that there are many evidence that uh, were reported almost at the same time. But uh, um, I love this analysis, which has been reported by the group of uh, Nicholas Turner in the UK. And they pulled together uh, two um, trials um, which were conducted before the use of CDK46. And these two trials compare aromatase inhibitor versus fulvestran. And they analyzed the outcome, and so it's a retrospective analysis, but based on the baseline ESR1 mutation status. And so what we get here is if you look at patients with wild type, ESR1 mutation, so which means it's not wild type, it's ESR1 mutation being not detected in patient blood. Um, you see the two brown curves here, and you see that in this patient, in the absence of ESR1 mutation, um, aromatase inhibitor and fulvestran had the same PFS. But if you look at the mutants, uh, so patient with detectable ESR1 mutation prior to treatment start, then it's a very different uh, situation. You see that patient with aromatase, treated by aromatase inhibitor had a very short PFS and had a longer PFS uh, with fulvestran. So which means that ESR1 mutation is a predictive marker of efficacy or rather inefficacy of aromatase inhibitor. And if you look at the curve, for example, patient with fulvest treated with fulvestran here, so the brown, this brown curve and this blue curve here, you see that fulvestran 
had the, exactly the same effect on wild type or mutant tumors. So which means ESR1 mutations are not a predictive factor of fulvestrant efficacy. And that is very important because with the new oral cells, we now have drugs that are more active on ESR1 uh, mutated tumors. So fulvestrant is equally active on ESR1 wild type and ESR1 mutated tumors. The only difference, again, is um, ESR1 mutations are associated with a poor sensitivity to AI. So, um, my fourth statement then was true. Fulvestrant is apparently, from what we know, equally active in patients with detectable ESR1 mutation in blood or not um, before treatment. So, last slide is to, um, I would like to come back uh, on the findings of the Genentech paper I mentioned initially. It's about um, you know, changing our understanding of the, on, regarding the mechanism of action of uh, cells. So we all learned at med school, and we were trained to say that cells binds on ER, and that the binding of cells would lead to ER degradation by the proteasome machinery. And because of um, you know, lower amount of ER um, in the cell, that would lead in turn to a lower proliferation. What, so I invite you to, to read this um, genetic paper again. I think it's very interesting. And the new model, because it, they tested the hypothesis with the genetic, uh, genetic compound, but also with other compounds, and also with fulvestran. And they show that cells are basically, um, they belong to a broad class that we can say, uh, we can call uh, estrogen receptor therapeutic ligands. And that class is kind of heterogeneous. And upon binding of third on the estrogen receptor, ER is maintained and immobilized on DNA. And that trapping of ER on DNA will suppress the transcriptional activity of estrogen receptor. And because of this trapping, ER will be degraded. And which means ER degradation is not required for a third to be active. And they are demonstrating it very clearly in this paper. It has some consequences, especially when you think in terms of drug development, because if you want to select a compound to, uh, you know, uh, do, to put it into the clinics, you, have, you could choose either to choose a compound that is uh, degrading the ER the most, or the compound that has a, a higher effect on the transcriptional machinery. And what the paper suggests is, again, uh, what does matter is more the immobilization of the ER and the prevention of uh, uh, the ER transcription machinery. And degradation is uh, maybe optional. So with that, I think I've finished with my presentation. Okay, so let's move now into the next talks, which is basically an overview about what we have today in the ER, HER2 negative, ER positive HER2 negative field. So this is what we have today in the clinical setting that we are going to discuss. We have different estrogen or endocrine treatments approved. We have tamoxifen from the very beginning. We have aromatase inhibitors, exemestain, anastrozole, letrozole, and we have fulvestrant. All these drugs have been approved in many countries across the globe. We also learned that the, way, the best way to administer fulvestrant was also based on the dose. It was developed with lower doses first. It was optimized with higher doses afterwards. Afterwards, or later, we learned that we can optimize endocrine therapy with different targeted agents. I will make some comments about CDK4 and CIS inhibitors in a minute. But also, we have data from Embrolimus first and from Alpelisib afterwards. With any of these drugs, we might optimize the role of endocrine therapy. Of course, in the discussion, we'll talk about the different outcomes when you go for CDK4 and CIS inhibitors. 
or when you go for PIK3CA, AKT, mTOR signaling pathway inhibitors. But this is uh, something to discuss afterwards. So the key question here is what to do after CDK4 and 6 inhibitor based therapy. So according to the guidelines, and remember that these guidelines have been developed without significant changes, because I think that we all agree that without an urgent need to treat these patients, we should continue with endocrine-based therapy, at least for the second and or the third line. According to the guidelines also, we agree that CDK-4 and 6 inhibitors should be used as soon as possible, now with data showing improvement in survival, although it was not explored the sequencing, if not in the second line. Also, we can discuss the role of different biomarkers here, the germline BRCA1 and or BRCA2 mutations, maybe PALV2, something to be discussed as well, and also the pic 3 ca mutation to discuss if we should continue with endocrine therapy, with or without the Berlimus, with or without alpelisib or PARP inhibitors. We also have nice biomarkers which correlates with efficacy of different drugs. But clearly, we think about endocrine therapy after CDK4 and 6 inhibitors. So you know the data, even better than me, about the first line, Mona Lisa 2, Paloma 2, and Monarch 3, showing a very nice improvement in progression-free survival, basically identical activity for the primary endpoint of all these trials. Also, it is true that from the overall survival perspective, no the primary endpoint of none of these trials. It's true that Mona Lisa 2 showed an improvement in survival. Paloma 2 failed to demonstrate that improvement. And let's see what happens with Monarch 3. In the second line or beyond, Paloma 3, a nice improvement, almost significant, and significant over survival data from Monarch 2 and Mona Lisa 3. So these drugs improved survival in the first and or in the second line setting. Something that has been coming with more and more attention is the activity of these drugs depending on the tumor biology. And according to some data, it seems that these drugs, basically ribocyclic, works similarly in luminal A and luminal B and in HER2 enriched tumors, but not in basal like. However, we should not forget that there are also data coming from uh, palbocyclic showing that palbocyclic also works in luminal A, in luminal B, and in HER2 enrich. I'm saying this because you know that there is an ongoing phase three clinical trial, which is called Harmonia, in the HER2 enrich patient population to compare palbo endocrine therapy, ribo endocrine therapy. I do not fully understand this trial, that's my opinion, because if we truly believe that ribocyclib is better than palbocyclib, why are we selecting patients based on this type of biology? If the preclinical data show that this drug works in all different subgroup of patients. But again, this is something, I don't know, just to maybe enter the discussion afterwards if needed. What is very clear is that after first line endocrine therapy, first line endocrine therapy, no first line endocrine based and CDK4 and 6 inhibitor first line. We have two randomized phase three trials, Bolero, exploring the role of Everolimus, plus Xemestein compared with Xemestein, and Solar One, exploring the role of Fulvestran plus Alpelisib compared with Fulvestran. Solar One was a biomarker based clinical trial with, uh, for patients with pic 3 ca mutations, and Bolero 2 was with unselected population. But you know here, and you can see here, very similar and very good results for the primary endpoint progression-free survival. Has a ratio very similar in, with Everlimus in all comers with Alpelisib in pic 3 ca In Boleo 2, there is a subgroup analysis retrospectively showing that in pic 3 ca mutations and in pic 3 ca wild type, 
every limus worked similarly. So two good trials to start the discussion about what to do after CDK4 and CC inhibitors plus endocrine therapy. Although again, Volero 2 did not include patients previously treated, pre treated with CDK, and in Solar 1, only 10% of patients did receive previous treatment with CDK4 and CIS inhibitors. Nevertheless, there is a second study regarding alpelisib, which in my opinion is key. So we develop new therapies. Now we have antibody drug conjugate. Now we have more and better drugs in the hair to positive field, in triple negative breast cancer, in ER positive. And some of these trials did not, or we have data from these trials that would not include the standard of care today. For example, in the ASEN study in triple negative breast cancer, how many patients received immunotherapy in the first line? So, Belief wanted to explore the role of alpelisib plus endocrine therapy in patients who received CDK and endocrine therapy before. And you can see here the results that the median PFS was basically identical or very similar to uh, Solar 1. So I think that this is my opinion, this is my first comment that maybe we can discuss afterwards, uh, um, Francois and Aditya. Do we need clinical trials to look at everything if we are moving forward? For example, do we need randomized clinical trials today to demonstrate that alpelisib work in patients with CDK4 and 6 inhibitors previously? This is something that maybe we have to discuss afterwards, because it's very important for the future development of the new drugs. So Francois made some comments about PADA1. I will make just maybe two key comments here. I think that for me, PADA1 is not ready to be used in the clinical practice. I don't know if you agree or not, but in my opinion, this is one of the smartest clinical trials in the field of ER positive HER2 negative disease. What have we learned from this study? That maybe we should change a drug which seems not to work as soon as possible, based on the great progression free survival results. But the obvious question here is, what about PFS2? So because there, I think in my opinion, we need a third arm. What happened for those patients who progress after endocrine therapy plus palbocyclic in this case, and after progressive disease, they change treatment into the, in this case, full vestran plus palbocyclic. So I think this is something that still we need to know. Nevertheless, very important clinical trial, in my opinion, and the way to develop the, the future studies. So clearly, we can go for palbocyclic, for ribocyclic, for abemacyclic, whatever you prefer. Afterwards, our patients will develop resistance and usually the medium PFS with endocrine therapy single agent is in the range of two months. This is, by the way, the median PFS we have in triple negative breast cancer, second, third, fourth line. Just for us to think about the prognosis of patients after CDK4 and 6 inhibitors. So we need anything else. We need to optimize treatments. That's why we need more and better drugs. And this is why we are here. And we have different ways to optimize endocrine therapy. And maybe we will have a discussion afterwards. Why not to start with antibody drug conjugates or with chemotherapy? Because the role of endocrine therapy in quality of life is key. There are some patients that can maintain the quality of life and the control of the disease for a very prolonged period of time after second or even after third line of treatment. So we should identify these patients and we should treat them with endocrine therapy, in my opinion. So you, uh, 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 Francois, made beautiful comments about this light. I will not enter into detail, although I will make a question for you to answer afterwards. Just prepare the answer. You can look at the internet if you want. So based on the mode of action of these different drugs, forget CERMS, forget full strand, the new search, and CERCAN, CERCAS, PROTAX, PROTOX, PROTUX, do you think that 
any of these family members might be more active than the other ones from a biological perspective. I'm not talking from the clinical perspective, we don't have this data, just your thoughts. My thought is that not really. So that's my answer, but I would like to hear your both uh, 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 thoughts. Okay, so how this search, uh, search work? You already discussed very nicely how basically they might degrade or not the receptors, but beautiful preclinical data. I will not enter into detail because you explained nicely before. So we have different agents which are on clinical development. Search, search, search. First polling question. Number one, last strand, Amsen strand, Gilead strand, and others. You know that unfortunately, I don't know if you will make some comments afterwards that some of these drugs, Amsen strand, has failed to demonstrate an improvement in the randomized phase two and in the randomized phase three study in combination with palbocyclib, but many, many new drugs in clinical development. Thank you, Javier, for the very uh, interesting, engaging talk. So let's start with the Emerald trial. Emerald was a global phase three trial, and both uh, Javier and uh, Francois were involved with this study. And on behalf of the co-authors, this was presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium last year. So as a reminder, this was a global phase three trial in postmenopausal women with ER positive, HER2 negative, advanced or metastatic breast cancer. The trial had three unique features. Um, the first is that it did allow for one prior line of chemotherapy. The second is that this was a trial in the second and third line ER positive breast cancer setting. So it required patients to have prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. And third, the trial had two primary endpoints, progression-free survival in the overall population and progression-free survival in patients who have ESR1 mutant metastatic breast cancer. Patients were randomized to receive elacestrant or endocrine therapy of physician's choice, which could be aromatase inhibitor or fulvestrant. The protocol had guidance in terms of the choice of endocrine therapy. So for example, if a patient had received AI plus CDK4-6 as first line, the protocol recommended that this patient should get fulvestrant and vice versa. If someone had received fulvestrant CDK4-6, it was recommended that they should get a different endocrine agent like an AI. So in terms of baseline characteristics, uh, they were well balanced between the two arms. This is what you want to see in a phase three trial. So looking at median age, looking at the ECOG performance status, bone mats, visceral vets, or the number of prior lines of therapy, these were all well balanced. This was a second, third line trial. And interestingly, in this study, majority of patients had visceral metastases. Close to two-thirds of patients who were enrolled in this trial had visceral metastases. And about 20% of patients in this trial had received one prior line of chemo. So this trial represented a patient population with slightly more aggressive tumor biology that we see in this setting. In terms of primary endpoint, the study met its primary endpoint. There was an improvement in progression-free survival with elacestrant as compared to standard of care endocrine therapy with a hazard ratio of 0.69. But when you look at the curves carefully, you see an interesting trend, something that has been seen previously in ER positive breast cancer, which is that there's an initial drop in both the arms and then you start to see a separation. So this initial drop likely represents endocrine-resistant disease. Again, as a reminder, this was in the second, third-line setting. Patients had already received prior endocrine therapy and had disease progression. So it's likely this subset that had endocrine-resistant disease, so you can use the best endocrine agent in the world, you're not going to see a difference because the tumor is endocrine-resistant. But then after that, you start seeing a separation. So that's likely where patients had endocrine-sensitive disease and with a better endocrine agent, you could start to see a separation. And this was particularly seen in tumors with ESR1 mutations. So as was reviewed previously, when tumors acquire ESR1 mutations, they become estrogen-independent, but they are still ER-dependent. 
They're still dependent on the estrogen receptor. So a drug that directly binds to ER, like elacestrin, potentially would work in this setting. And so you could clearly see a separation of the curves with a hazard ratio of 0.54. So as I mentioned previously, because there was a drop in the curves initially and then separation, median PFS alone can be a misleading uh, statistic. So in, when you see a curve like this, it's also important to look at landmark analysis, PFS at six months and 12 months, because that's where you can really capture the difference between two agents. So if you look at PFS rate at 12 months, you could see that patients were much likely to uh, be on treatment if they were on elacestrant as compared to standard of care endocrine therapy. So 22.3% PFS rate at one year with elacestrant versus 9.4% with standard endocrine therapy. And similarly, in the ESR1 mutant subgroup, you were more than um, likely to remain on drug if you were on elacestrant at one year as compared to standard endocrine therapy, 26.8% versus 8.2%. And then in comparison to fulvestrant, so fulvestrant is an intramuscular uh, surd. Uh, in this trial, uh, close to two-thirds of patients had received fulvestrant. So comparing elacestrant to fulvestrant, you see a similar trend, initial drop and then separation. And clearly in the ESR1 mutant group, you see a separation with a hazard ratio of 0.54. And then looking at all the subgroups in terms of visceral metastases, race, region, measurable disease, uh, you see that there was benefit in all the subgroups with the less estrant. And then finally, in terms of overall survival, um, the overall survival results were not mature when they were presented last year. There was a trend towards improvement in overall survival with the less estrant, but um, updated results um, will be presented later on because this is event-driven uh, analysis. So once the uh, adequate number of events have been reached, the overall survival analysis would be conducted and results presented. Now, how about safety? Whenever we talk about drug, we have to talk both about efficacy as well as safety. In terms of safety, there were no major surprises. Overall, uh, treatment-related AEs were quite low. Uh, less than 10% of patients discontinued either elacestrant or standard of care endocrine therapy. And there were no treatment-related deaths in either arms. In terms of the type of adverse event, uh, nausea was the number one side effect seen with elacestrant is given as uh, an oral medication and nausea was seen. Grade three, grade four nausea incidence being 2.5%. Besides nausea, the other AEs were pretty much similar between the two arms, uh, hot flashes, um, arthralgias, they were pretty much similar between standard of care endocrine therapy and elacestrant. Now, so this was presented at San Antonio, then at ASCO this year, there were subgroup analyses presented looking at patients who had not received prior chemotherapy and the intent was twofold. One was that would capture a patient population that does not have uh, an aggressive biology, if you will. And B, we also wanted to look at, in this population, what the hazard ratio and PFS was. So not surprisingly, you saw a benefit in this population, a hazard ratio of 0.681 for the overall study and 0.53 for uh, patients with ESR1 mutations. But if you look at median PFS, the median PFS with elacestrant was uh, 5.3 months versus 1.9 months with standard endocrine therapy. And then at ESMO this year, uh, Dr. Aftemos would be presenting results comparing elacestrant versus aromatase inhibitors and also the uh, fulvestrant results, and uh, that's being presented at ESMO this year. So to summarize, Emerald is the first clinical trial to report positive results from, um, from a phase three study evaluating oral CERD. It demonstrated that an oral CERD was more effective than fulvestrant and other standard endocrine therapies in patients who had disease progression on a prior CDK4-6 inhibitor, and this was in the second and third line. The trial met its primary endpoint both 
in ESR1 mutant as well as overall uh, population. Elacestrant uh, could, could be a potential standard of care treatment option in the second, third line setting. The company has uh, filed for approval uh, and then has announced this publicly as well. And this might be uh, particularly appropriate as a single agent uh, where single agent endocrine therapy is appropriate. We'll review combinations as well. So elacestrin currently is under regulatory review by EMA and the FDA based on the results of the Emerald trial. So to put this in clinical practice and uh, future directions, so the Emerald trial uh, showed that elacestrin could become a standard of care treatment option. But currently, as Javier mentioned, if you look at the algorithm for patients who have pic 3 ca mutant disease, we tend to use fulvestrin plus alpelacin. So what should be done in that setting? So there are two options. One is one could certainly consider fulvestrin alpelacin, and then after that, consider elacestrant, uh, and in the emerald sub-analysis, patients who had received prior fulvestrant, even in that subgroup, there was benefit with elacestrant. Or hopefully in the future, we'll start to see combination. If fulvestrant plus alpelacid worked, maybe elacestrant plus alpelacid would also work and be better because you have a better ER blocker um, in this setting. So molecular analysis looking at uh, ESR1 mutations, pic 3 c mutations, these are likely going to be even more important as we move forward in the field of ER-positive breast cancer. So we reviewed a positive study. There have also been two negative trials, the first one being AMIRA-03. Uh, there was a press release a few months ago that AMIRA-03 did not meet its primary endpoint of improving PFS. It was a randomized phase two trial. The results of AMIRA-03 will be presented tomorrow um, at the uh, ESMO meeting. Uh, when these slides were made, this was based on the press release, um, and the slides were submitted, but as often happens, by the time you submit slides, the next day things change. And so we got a recent press release as of a week ago that AMIRA-05, which was looking at amsenestrant plus palbocyclib, was also a negative trial and the sponsor has decided to discontinue the clinical development of amsenestrant. The other clinical trial is Axelera. This looked at Jodicestrant versus physician's choice of endocrine therapy. This was also a randomized phase two trial. It did not meet its primary endpoint of improving PFS. As per the press release, there was a suggestion of benefit with Jodicestrant in endocrine sensitive tumors. These results will also be presented tomorrow in the same session with AMIRA-03, so we look forward to the results. In particular, it'll be interesting to look at the ESR1 mutant subgroup to see what the signal is. Now, besides elacestrant, judicestrant, uh, there are other surges in clinical development. Immunolestrant is a uh, is an oral surge that's being evaluated in randomized phase three trial, as well as camisazestrant is an oral surge that's being evaluated in randomized phase two and phase three trials. And besides surge, there are other agents as well, circas, which have a different mechanism of action. They don't degrade the estrogen receptor per se, but they um, put a they they bind to the estrogen receptor. Uh, as an antagonist. There's also Seran and finally Protax like ARV471, all of which uh, are being evaluated in phase one, phase two, and phase three trials are being planned as well. Now, one thing we have to be very careful about with all these studies is that the patient uh, setting, the study, the disease setting, as well as the tumor biology does matter especially when these drugs are evaluated in the second and third line setting, because that is a setting where patients have already received endocrine therapy. And if one of the mechanisms by which the tumor is resistant to endocrine therapy is ER independence, such as activation of the MAP kinase pathway or uh, HER2 mutation or some other factor that leads to the tumor becoming ER independent, then in that setting, it's unlikely that single agent endocrine therapy is going to work. 
You can have an endocrine therapy with 100% ER pathway inhibition, but if the ER pathway is not driving the tumor, it's not going to work. And I think that's a very important, very simple, but very important point in the second and third line setting when these drugs are being evaluated. In this setting, combination therapy is likely going to work because if the tumor is ER pathway independent, it's dependent on some other pathway. It could be PI3 kinase pathway. So if you block the PI3 kinase pathway, such as with alpelacib in pic 3 cm mutant tumors, you're likely going to see activity as was seen in the SOLAR1 trial. Similarly, in the faction trial, in tumors that had AKT alterations, the combination of an AKT inhibitor to fulvestrant showed improvement in outcomes. So this is all in the metastatic second, third line setting. The best setting to study an endocrine agent is in early breast cancer, because majority of ER positive breast cancers are endocrine sensitive. And that's the best setting where you can really evaluate the efficacy uh, of an endocrine agent. Often these trials start in the neoadjuvant setting as proof of principle. So for example, the Cuopera trial looked at neoadjuvant jodecestrant versus anastrozole in patients with uh, early uh, stage ER positive breast cancer and looked at KI67 as the primary endpoint because KI67 is a surrogate marker for event-free survival. And the study showed that there was higher suppression of KI67 with jodecestrant as compared to anastrozole. So you have some proof of principle that jodecestrant at least uh, based on proliferation, could be superior to aromatase inhibitors. And this has led to the phase three adjuvant trial, the LIDERA trial, looking at jodecestrant versus uh, treatment of choice endocrine therapy, tamoxifen or AI in the adjuvant setting for patients with stage one to stage three, medium or high risk ER positive breast cancer. So this is going to be a pivotal study because this would really ask the question, is one endocrine agent better than the other in predominantly endocrine sensitive disease? It's just that these adjuvant trials take a while to enroll and have outcomes, so we look forward to the results. Okay, thanks very much, Aditya and Francois, for your great, great talks. I would like to, because we have many, many questions for the, for the discussion, but maybe I would like to have one more question to be included in a clinical case to answer, and afterwards we'll start the discussion. But this is the same year old women, ERPR positive, HER2 negative, 10 years ago. She had a PT2 and 2 series of adjuvant chemotherapy, followed by aromatase inhibitor for four years before stopping the treatment based on, on joint pain. So while on adjuvant aromatase inhibitors, she developed right hip pain and uh, she developed bone lesions. Liver metastasis here, biopsy revealed ER positive, PR positive, HER2 positive disease. Now, NGS observed peak 3CA mutation. She started with fulvestran plus palbocyclip and afterwards, she had a progressive disease. Now, I will not make any comments to the audience. You have everything available. You have Elastran approved. You have Alplexib approved. You can use whatever you want. In this patient, how would you like to treat? Francois, maybe you can start so, from the European perspective. Uh, I think that's... Uh first question we have to ask ourselves is whether we would try to re-challenge um, with a second line that would be based on orlokin therapy or whether we would choose uh, uh, to go for a chemo, first line chemotherapy in this patient. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can go back to the cases, I'm not sure. So if you remind well, um, this is a 70-something-year-old um, lady and she was put, uh, because of a relapse and the adjuvant AI, she was put on uh, fulvestran plus uh, CDK46 inhibitor. And then she had a very long PFS um, of about 20 something months. And if I am correct, she is experiencing a disease progression, but which is not symptomatic. So she has an, um, 
uh, liver involvement, but this is not symptomatic. And she had a very long PFS because 20 something months on uh, Fulvestran plus CDK46 uh, in, patient, uh, in a patient who is uh, endocrine resistant. I think that uh, it's a very good response to uh, first line endocrine based therapy. So I think that I would, first thing, I would remove chemotherapy from the uh, different option. So I would definitely consider something that is really containing endocrine therapy and that is built on endocrine therapy. So uh, I don't know if you want to continue on the seeking. <coughs> so Aditya? Uh, I agree. I think um, you know, this patient who had received adjuvant AI in the first line setting, I would have done the same. I would have done full vestrant plus a CDK46 inhibitor. This patient received palbocyclib, whether now in this day and age, now that we have overall survival results, whether we should do palbocyclib or a different agent, ribo or abema, I think that's uh, up for discussion. But I would do full vestrant plus a CDK46 inhibitor. At the time of disease progression after that, the traditional paradigm has been to do capecitabine or some would do exemestane plus evrolimus. It's unlikely that someone would do exemestin alone. It's usually given uh, in combination with Avrolimus. But I like the idea of an oral surd. This is the perfect setting to consider an oral surd after uh, full Western plus uh, palbocyclib, uh, particularly if there's ESR1 mutation. Which brings me to the second case that we were discussing is that this patient had pic 3 ca mutation, but what was the ESR1 mutation status? I don't know your institution, uh, and, and we can discuss, but at our institution, usually patients get panel testing. So if I'm checking for PIK3CA, I usually know the results of other genes as well, including ESR1. So if the patient has ESR1 mutation plus PIK3CA mutation, I would then lean towards ideally an oral SERD plus alpelisib. Uh, if that's not available, then I guess you could do full vestrant alpelisib or just an single agent oral surd, uh, but having that information really becomes valuable. Okay, let me start with a hot comment, hot question. So, I've been talking about Everlimus for many years. I like Everlimus, it's a drug, I like it. I don't know why, but I like it. And I said that if we have, if we learn how to use it in terms of toxicity, this is a, such a friendly drug. But it's true that it had some financial toxicity in the past. Now, this is a generic drug. And suddenly, it's, happened to, it's starting to be used more and more, which is interesting. However, now some of the comments out of there is that elastostrand was developed against single-agent endocrine therapy and not against alpelisib-based or against everlimus-based which is surprising to me, because I, have, as I have been criticized because I was using Everlimus, or now Alpelisib, or whatever, and I said, you don't have survival data, they are very toxic, and now it seems that you have a good drug, which improves outcomes, and we should have used the standard of care with Everlimus or Alpelisib. So I would like to hear your thoughts here. So was the standard of care in Emerald the optimal or a very good standard of care for this compound, or we should have conducted another trial with another contrarm to have the beauty of this, of this drug. Comments about that? Sure, I can start and would love to hear from uh, Fraswe as well. So at the time that Emerald was designed, it was the standard of care. Uh, Alpelisib was not approved at that time, and even in the Avrolimus data with ESR1 mutation was a bit shaky. So the idea was, can we compare one endocrine agent versus another? And that's what Emerald was designed for. And this is something we often face in the field. You design a trial, you answer a question. By the time you answer the question, the field has evolved. Let me give two quick examples. One was the alpelisib in the post-CDK46 setting. Solar One did not have patients, a majority of patients who had received first-line CDK46 inhibitor. And that's why when the results were presented, this question came up, oh, but what happens after CDK46? Does alpelisib work? And that led to the belief trial. Otherwise, we would not need the belief trial. It was just that the field had evolved. 
in, say, triple negative breast cancer, we have pembrolizumab approved in the adjuvant setting, but that's as a single agent, not in combination with capecitabine uh, that was developed based on CREATEX. So this often happens where you answer a study question, but the field evolves, and then you have to address that. I think to address this issue of alpelacib, we ideally need a study. Uh, at the minimum, a safety study that looks at combination of elacestrant with alpelacib, and if that looks good, both from a safety perspective and some signal of efficacy, clinically, I would feel very comfortable using that combination. Also, I think I would like to highlight that also neither Everimus nor Alplicib have shown an improvement in survival, by the way. So we have an improvement in, in PFS. We like or we, that's, we don't like the drugs. Doesn't matter about that now. So I think that in addition to what you said, I think that we all agree that for the time being, I think that the, the standard of care, the control arm in Emerald was absolutely appropriate. And I think that the data we have is quite robust. So, Francois, one, one comment for you. So, before coming here. So, okay. So, another thought about the Emerald results was about the median PFS. Well, the median PFS is less than one month. Okay, folks. But as you pointed out very nicely, the curves are beautiful. There are 40% of patients who are very resistant to endocrine therapy. We should identify them or combine with target agents. But just after, the curves are really beautiful. And which is more important, they maintain a very good shape in the tail. So do you think that the median PFS is the way we should look at these curves, or we should look at, as you pointed out, the shape and try to optimize which are the patients who will benefit more or less. Yes, sure. Um, so clearly the curves are very interesting. Um, it shows that you have a, a part of the population, which is about half of the population, that will have a very um, early progression. And these patients are clearly endocrine resistant. So you, we need biomarker. And I think that the beauty of Emerald was it, it was able to highlight ESR1 mutation detected in blood uh, prior to a second line start uh, as a predictive biomarker of elastestron efficacy. And I mentioned that for fulvestron, it's not a predictive biomarker of efficacy. So here it's really, uh, we have a drug that uh, is working better in ESR1 mutated patients. So is that enough? That, that is the question. Still, you see still an early drop even in ESR1 mutated patients. So which means that we need to take into account ESR1 mutation status, but other biomarkers. So what are these um, other biomarkers? So I don't, I'm not sure I, have the answer, but we, knew, we know that we have new functional imaging, such as uh, FES uh, PET CT, and we have also so other circulating biomarkers, could be CTC or could be you know, a broader um, estimation of, what, uh, of the tumor content and the genomic landscape through CT, large panel CT DNA assessment and, or um, genomic signature assessment. So I think that ESR1 is something we can build on. It's a very strong biomarker, and it has been shown by Emerald and Padawan as well. And we need to add something and to understand. So um, just to, to go a, a bit further, I think that the current uh, second line, as we are seeing it now, is probab will probably collapse in a, in a year to come. So the idea is that every patient should be put on endocrine therapy uh, based treatment after the first nine, uh, because we are seeing uh, chemotherapy or chemotherapy-like agents such as ADCs that are coming and very good efficacy. Um, I think that the second line uh, is not very satisfactory. And um, also, if you consider PADA1, you can transition from the first line to the second line without uh, true progression. So maybe that we'll have some patients that will transition from one endocrine agent to a second one while maintaining CDK46 inhibition, that is PADA1, that is also maintained. And then for the other patients um, that are more likely to be endocrine resistance, we'll probably have an earlier use of um, chemotherapy or chemotherapy-like agents. Which is amazing is that when you look at the approval of fulvestran, the robustness of the data is lower than the emerald. So the hazard ratio is lower, the median PFS, the improvement in PFS is identical compared to higher doses with lower doses, and nobody discusses here that fulvestran is the standard of care in that setting. So this is interesting, by the way. Okay, so now, questions. So 
Okay, do you think that the potency of search could be affected by previous treatment with CDK for ANCC inhibitors? So there is preclinical data to suggest that combination of surge plus a CDK46 inhibitor works in both ESR1 mutant and wild type. So I think it is a good combination to consider combining an ER uh, blocker with a CDK46 inhibitor, and that could be any of the CDK46 inhibitors. And there are ongoing trials looking at um, oral surge with a CDK46 inhibitor in the first line setting. The challenge there is that the control arm is AI CDK46, which does very well. The question is, can you identify a subgroup that would not derive that much benefit from AI plus CDK46, maybe based on prior exposure, and that's the setting to evaluate uh, this agent. Uh, you led the Parsifal trial. I don't know, Javier, if you have any thoughts related to the Parsifal trial, because I think that was a very important study that highlighted this concept that you just cannot do a study for all comers comparing AI CDK46 and surge CDK46. You need to identify a study population uh, to look at the difference. Yeah, I agree. Okay, regarding the estrogen receptor gene one mutation, what's happening here? You have a patient that received are not inhibitors in the adjuvant setting and develops metastasis afterwards. However, the number of mutations there is much lower than for those patients who develop metastasis on treatment with aromatase inhibitors. What, what, which, do you, which is the reason, in your, in your opinion, why, depending on the time on treatment, the, the, the time on resistance, we might have more or less mutations in this gene? Yes, that's, uh, thank you. So that's, that's related to the biology. That is a kind of striking um, uh, finding. So again, very few patients have ESR1 mutation when they elapse, even if uh, they have been exposed to adjuvant AI. And then when they are put to, uh, on an AI-based treatment in the first line, um, almost the majority of these patients will develop an ESR1 mutation at time of progression. So uh, I don't have the answer to explain that uh, for sure, but the current... Uh, the, we have two ways to answer it. First, relating to testing. Remember that ESR testing is mostly done on blood, and patients that are relapsing have a lower tumor burden, which means less ctDNA circulating than patients that are uh, you know, uh, having uh, their uh, late stage metastatic breast cancer. These patients have a lot of ctDNA, so it's much easier to detect an ESR1 mutation. So it might be a bit related, but that's not, uh, that's not the full explanation. The other explanation is that if you consider a patient that will relapse, and uh, it's likely that the relapse um, after adjuvant AI is due to, let's say, 10 or 100 tumor cells that were spread initially from the primary tumor. And if you consider that um, in a primary tumor, the likelihood of a tumor cell, so you have one mutated cell of, out of, um, let's say, one million, out of, um, let's say, 100,000, what is the probability that these few tumor cells that would yield to the relapse harbor this mutation is low? So which means it's like, it's like the funding effect in genetics, which means the few tumor cells that left the tumor have a very low likelihood to bear this mutation. So the relapse will likely be ESR1 wild type. If you consider a patient that have um, um, so distant metastasis and a lot of tumor burden, so all the cells will be exposed to AI, they will shrink, but at the end you will keep these one out of a million um, tumor cells that harbor this ESR1 mutation. So that cell will start to grow and um, that could be an explanation, like a, a bit of a funding effect in the metastatic process. Now that's a fascinating concept. So that relates to the tumor volume or the tumor burden yeah. as a factor that causes development of these mutations. And maybe, I don't know if you've looked at this, in the PADA1 trial, you probably have baseline uh, tumor metrics in terms of resist. So you could look at the tumor volume based on that and see if that's a predictor of development of ESR1 mutations. Yes, uh, that's something we'll look at. Uh, so uh, probably uh, reported at San Antonio, but it's also interesting as a concept because you know, maybe if you reduce the tumor burden uh, in this patient at the very beginning, maybe they are, could be less likely to develop ESR1 mutation later. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Yeah. I love this question. Everlamus plus fulvestran or examestane is a potential option after CDK for ANCC inhibitors. What are your thoughts about elastestran in combination with Everlamus? 
I love it. No, I think it's a great. Love it. I, I leave, yeah, it so leave, that, leave, that, leave it there. Leave it there. I love it as well. Yeah, that, 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 that's a bit of label still, and you have to check uh, drug bug interaction and toxicity. So, some clinical results would be are needed. I I would assume. Absolutely. But we'll probably get them soon. Okay. So, in the clinical practice, today, Monday morning, Monday morning will be here. Tuesday or Wednesday. Do we have to test estrogen receptor gene one, ES or whatever, one mutation, yes or no, for the clinical practice? I think in part it would depend on the FDA approval. Uh, if the drug gets approved and it's approved for all comers, you don't need to check for that. But if the approval is for ESR1 mutant, I think we'll be forced to check for that. Uh, that's clear. But in the meantime, it's not mandatory for the clinical correct. practice, correct? Okay. So. Another important question is, which is the time frame to re-biopsy a ER positive hair to negative tumor? So you have a baseline, you go for CDK Francis inhibitor, do you biopsy afterwards and later on, or what are your thoughts about when to re-biopsy the tumor? I can Any start and would love to hear from you as well. Uh, in general, we are big believers in liquid biopsy. We have many questions. If it's very difficult, forget it. <laughs> Thanks for choosing the, these ones. Uh, liquid biopsies, yes, particularly after progression of first-line therapy with uh, AI plus CDK4-6, because if a patient has pic 3 c mutation, you could consider alpelacin. But then is there value of doing serial liquid biopsies or tissue biopsies? Probably not. Um, if it's been more than two or three years, sometimes we do consider liquid biopsy uh, or a tissue biopsy, and that's largely for enrollment in clinical trials because you can discover acquired alterations, including HER2, and if the institution has trials that are dedicated to that, it could help enrollment in that trial. Two questions about the same topic. What about, let's say, triple positive? means here ER, ER positive, and HER2 low. So is there any roles about search here, about the new antiviral conjugates? Do you think that the sequence should be the other way around, starting with the uh, antiviral conjugates and moving to search afterwards? Any no. comments or thoughts yes. for, for our friends here? Yes, so that's probably, that's something I was referring to when I was saying that maybe that in the five years to come, so our current second line, as we understand it, will collapse, which means uh, for this patient with, um, let's say, um, new targets, could be her to low or could be uh, something else, uh, maybe we'll have uh, agents that are so efficient that we won't be satisfied with our current um, second line PFS. Um, so we'll have to you know, navigate between different biomarkers. And I think it is critical, really, to understand what are the biomarkers driving, you know, to isolate patients that are very most likely to have long PFS in the second line. So again, ESR1 and other uh, uh, marker related to the efficacy. If we are not moving that way, uh, it's also likely that you know the uh, hair to low, uh, all hair to low patients will get TDXD uh, so sooner rather than later, and that the new cells will be used afterwards. You know, it's an interesting concept, and Destiny Breast 6 is looking at this question. DDXT as first line chemo option was a standard of care uh, chemotherapy like uh, capecitabine or paclitaxel. So it'll be interesting to see the results from that trial. Um, and more and more, I guess we'll have to redefine the biology. When you said triple positive, I thought you meant ER, yeah. PR, HER2 positive. But now this HER2 low, that's like two that's and a half. <laughs> that's two and a half positive. So, but I think that we have to try to keep. The, so at the end, the patient will be able to receive the antibiotic conjugate afterwards. If we can give a pill to the patient, I think usually in terms of quality of life also is something to be considered. It's not just PFS. It's to maintain a good quality of life. It's not the same to go every three weeks to the hospital with a... I'm not talking about CAPE, cytamine. I'm talking about IV chemotherapy or antibiotic conjugate. So I think this is another important point. I broke the program, so I will continue the last two minutes. Usually happens with this program for, for me. Two minutes, but I have two or three more comments. Before I said about different circas, certs, serons, do you think that there are any different systems of biology that might explain differences, or really important differences about outcomes with these drugs? Okay, uh, so we don't know yet. Of course, we'll have to look at uh, you know, uh, late line uh, trial uh, 
results. Um, I would call all of these agents ER therapeutic ligands and could be covalent, could be not covalent, and uh, could be more on the same um, side, could be more on the third side, but again, uh, mechanism of action is somehow similar. Uh, I think PROTAC is something very different and, uh, in terms of mechanism of action, but then, you know, SERAN, or, you know, I think it's more a bit of marketing, uh, like, you know, this way to call their drug, because being like the, let's say, sixth, third, on them to be developed is not very attractive for uh, clinicians or investors. Um, so, ER therapeutic ligands is the most, uh, is my favorite language about these drugs. So, friends, what is very clear is that we have a new great option to treat our patients. We would love to optimize, of course, this drug with other target agents and learn much more about that. One of the questions were, was why other sets with uh, palocyclic with the first line setting were not positive, and this drug has been positive in the second, third line. So, the obvious question is two different drugs are two different drugs. I don't know if this is because of the combination with CDK France inhibitors but I'm Senestrand also failed to demonstrate an improvement in the second third line setting. So thank you very much to you all for being here with us today. Enjoy the rest of the meeting and hope to also enjoy the city. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash DFJ860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Stemline Therapeutics GmbH, a Menorini Group company.